Hello, it is producer Luke with a quick message before this week's Wickham Wanderers show. Uh, we were hoping to bring you an interview with Jack Grimmer uh, during the Thursday show. Uh, obviously, this is now the podcast version, uh, so you will hear mentions of that. Sadly, it didn't happen. Uh, these things happen. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to talk to Jack, uh, if not next week, sometime soon uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, so enjoy this week's show. Uh, over to Bob and Colin. <laughs> Wanderers show. Good evening and welcome to the latest edition of the Wickham Wanderer Show. It'll be a good one this evening. We, we like the club, have uh, been gaining momentum. <laughs> we have, yes. Um, no car parking spaces for us, but the club have gained uh, another 200. Yes. How exciting. That, <laughs> if that is exciting, <laughs> then, <laughs> then yes. Well, the, the car park thing's rumbled on no, of really, course. You know, through the Sunderland game and, and now with Oxford coming as well. Uh, everyone seems to be moaning about the car parking spaces. Not not Wickham Wanderers people. No, no. Like, like you know, external people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even people who haven't got, well, they've only got a ground that's got three sides. Dear, yes. oh dear. You know, sort, sort yourselves out before you start moaning about our car parking. Uh, coming up this week, we'll be reflecting on car parking. No, we won't. Uh, we'll be reflecting on that fantastic three-all draw in the televised game at Adams Park on Saturday, uh, which, of course, uh, built momentum. You can, you can never build too much momentum, can you? That's very true. For um, the rearranged trip to Bolton. Yes, uh, and what a rearranged trip <laughs> it was. Um, even though there were problems on the, the M6 and yes. some fans only just managed to get there. That was um, like a car park. Yeah, it really was, yes. Um, but anyway, but, but we, we came good. Uh, a 2-0 victory uh, made even sweeter by the fact that Sunderland also lost 3-1 at Lincoln City. Uh, uh, on the same evening. Yes, that did work well. Uh, now, just a point off the uh, the top of the table. Uh, we'll hear from Joe Jacobson, from manager Gareth Ainsworth, speaking after both games. Uh, we were going to uh, uh, play you a recorded interview from Jack Grimmer, who scored, of course, his debut goal on uh, Tuesday. But we've got something better than that, because he's actually going to join us live. So we'll, we'll catch up with him later this hour. Very much looking forward to that. And we'll speak to former striker Keith Searle as well who was part of a number of title-winning sides, also featured in the uh, 1975 third-round FA Cup uh, uh, two ties, as it's known. <laughs> <laughs> two ties against Middlesbrough. <laughs> two ties, Middlesbrough. Uh, some uh, fantastic memories from him. Uh, really looking forward to that. So a really good show in prospect. Yes, it's going to be a great one. Award-winning. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. At least award-nominated, you'd like to think. Yes. We're, we're already um, uh, going to submit it as, as soon as 8 o'clock comes around. <laughs> so, yeah, let's let's look at uh, Sunderland, which uh, was a, 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 obviously a, a juicy uh, encounter in the first place when, when you're playing a team so high on the table and, and fellow promotion chasers. And slightly wet as well. <laughs> yeah, it's very uh, wet. <laughs> um, and just, you know, well, what a fantastic game. What a super game of football. Really, really enjoyable. Uh, looked like, yes, it was going to be heartbreak for us, um, but no. Joe Jacobson coming up right at the end uh, to ensure. In fact, I mean, it, you know, it was really it was the Joe Jacobson show, wasn't it? Because not only did Joe score, but he also uh, had the amazing overhead kick to deny Sunderland what looked like an absolute certain goal. Um, that, you know, I was watching on the TV and I thought, oh, and I still such a seesaw I, game as well. I still can't really work out how Joe Jacobson did what he did. How how you know? So the ball went over Stockdale, and Jacobson managed to do a, an overhead kick and clear the ball away. It was just just remarkable. Well, I don't think you could do it. No, exactly. But it's one of those things that had a Man United player done it. Had it been done on a Super Sunday game, that would they'd still be talking about it now? And the BBC would have done a poll of like you know top ten most amazing defensive you know saves or whatever. Um, but of course, because it's on a, a, a half past twelve and it's a league game on a, on the FA Cup third uh, third round day, nobody really notices. But it was it was absolutely breathtaking, and so many other great talking points from the game as well. With the, obviously, as I say, a seesaw uh, game. Yes, yeah, just amazing, really. Um, and you did think, well. Yeah, we, you know, we are, uh, again, if we're, if we're going to be serious about this going up business, mm. this is a game that we need to get something out of. Uh, and for a little while, I was slightly thinking, oh, goodness me. Um, but no, we, you know, we did OK. Um, and to get a point against Sunderland, I think that's, you know, it's so much better than thinking back to the game up at the stadium of like earlier on this season. Um, when And I know I, I've heard a couple of Wickham players, and in fact, I think even Jack Grimmer said it, that, you know, that he felt that we were a bit unlucky. I mean, I was at that game at the stadium like, and you did, you know, we, we were slightly outclassed that day. Um, and it was one of those times where you thought, oh, yeah, it's going to be quite a long afternoon. And sure enough, it was. That's how it looked, um, obviously, on Saturday uh, with Stockdale's own goal. I mean, you know, unfortunate own goal after three minutes. 
and uh, you were thinking, oh dear, okay, this isn't going to necessarily go away. But, you know, Messi, a fantastic performance, always looked dangerous every time that he was on the ball. Um, Sunderland didn't really seem to know what to do with him and seemed, seemed to back off him a few times, which he thought, well, no, actually, that's it. Not, not that I'm a particularly a defensive expert, but that's probably not the thing to do. Uh, Sam Folks, of course, as well scoring. Uh, then Ross Stewart did sound on the commentary like they kept saying Rod Stewart, which conjured up some strange <laughs> strange images. Um, but then equalising to make it two all at half time. Um, and then he obviously scored in the, the third minute of injury time, just squeaking the ball past David Stockdale and it was one of those and I, I'm going to talk about the Jack Grimmer goal in a minute where you could see that it was going in all the way the, the Ross Stewart third goal on the TV first of all when, it, when, he, when he knocked it past Stockdale it really looked like it was going to hit the post and, and I think probably anyone watching on the TV thought oh he's missed it and then somehow it sort of it bended in a bit like sort of like if he'd been a golfer it, it as if he put a bit of spin on it or something and it was like oh no but yeah, JJ came up with the with the goods. Ninety minutes plus eight. Very exciting. In that way that we we always have lots of injury time. We do. Yes, you, you never never leave early. No, as, as Gareth will not. say shortly. We'll hear from Joe Jacobson in a few moments' time. But first, uh, the manager Gareth Ainsworth spoke to Phil afterwards. This team never ever gives in. Never knows when it's beat. The belief in the boys is incredible. I thought we had the, just slightly the better of the first half. Sunderland definitely had the better of the second half. What a game, you know, and what a finish to it. It's just, uh, it's just a fantastic game on TV as well, and uh, and chaos before the game. You know, people pulling out, um, injuries, and the COVID situation. I can't really, uh, you know, dissect the game as well as I want to. Some mistakes, some brilliant goal line clearances, a penalty shout. It had all sorts today. But I'm glad to say that the graft and the effort the boys put in, they deserve something out today, and they got a point. It's almost belies belief this equaliser that comes with when Sunderland scored everyone looked at their clock and went oh there's six minutes to go and they almost expect the equaliser now yeah and you know we teams get this once or twice a season we seem to get five or six a season of these games it's crazy you know but I'm, I'm saying that's testament to this group of boys that I've got the belief that we can put in them and uh and the hunger they've got to go back to that championship, you know, in front of the fans. Because today, I mean, massive credit to the Sunderland fans. You know, I have to give it because they were fantastic. You know they're going to be. They're brilliant. It's a huge football club. Um, they, they need to get back in them higher leagues. But the Wickham boys, the Wickham fans, the Wickham players weren't overawed. We, we matched this team, you know, and 3-3, uh, and three, three, it's a great game. It's a great spectacle. People bull us as this long ball team. Yeah, we'll get the ball forward to the final third. But once we're in that final third... There's no better players than Gareth McLear and Anas Mametti at times on the ball. You know, Brandon Hanlon rolling people, Josh going finding splitting passes, you know. Um, but keep billing us as whatever you want. But I'm really proud of the boys and, uh, and our billing is a fantastic side to it. Covid's played its part this week with Sunderland putting the game into doubt initially, but yeah. a changed side as well. It must have been very difficult to prepare for that. Yeah, and, and I, I said before the game, I want to give credit again to Lee Johnson and Sunderland because they've played the game. They've come out and gone, no, we'll play. We've, had, we've got COVID cases, but we'll play. They've done it right. They've done it the right way. I'm not saying anyone hasn't, but there's a few rumours going around that people wanted to get to that transfer window. Um, we, we absolutely respect that massively, and I'm glad that the game was such a spectacle today. It had everything, you know. I mean, Ross Stewart's hell of a play, you know, and, and he'll go on to some huge, huge things in this league, and, and that was a great learning curve for my defenders. Young defender Chris Farino coming in, TJ Debar getting his first league, league minutes, you know. We've got this team now that's developing and growing and we've got to try and match these fabulous sides and, uh, and we're doing that and I can't wait to Tuesday now. I've just told the boys, get your emotions down and take that, that 97th minute celebration into Tuesday night away at Bolton because we need to go again. We need to start picking points up if we want to stay amongst the top teams like Sunderland and, and you know, your, your Wiggins and your, and your Portsmouth and your Sunderland. I, I mean, there's some fantastic teams in this, Charlton, Wigan. It's the next Premier League. To be in it is brilliant and to be at the right end of it, it's even better. Thank you, boys. I've all missed out today. He gets the ball in one nils. I get the three threes, which is crazy. But I think he'll, uh, he'll have been uh, jumping around the living room just like I was last week as well. I was about to say, you looked a bit lonely on the touchline today. Yeah, I was a little bit. You know, Sam Grace has stepped up and Lee Harrison is always there. But it was great. And do you know what? Recently, we lost a couple of fans, uh, Lena and David at uh, Robertson. And, uh, and that really, you know, puts things in perspective. And, and Dave Robertson, the director of football when I took over he signed JJ so how apt is that that JJ gets that equaliser I'm sure that 
he'll be uh, he'll be doing somersaults up there somewhere, and uh, his family were here as well to see that. So, and Lana, who was in the Elena, sorry, who was in the terracing um, with uh, with the shouters and the singers, who really came through today. So, um, you know, and for everyone we've lost last year, that's that's a little bit back for them as well. Yeah, it's a fantastic end to the game, and an important equaliser as well with the run of fixtures coming up, Bolton away, Oxford. I mean, this is a fantastic month for Wickham Wanderers, big games. But how important was that point today in the in the grand scheme? Of things? It will be told at the end of the season, you know, points against the top teams is something I've been speaking about to the boys. You know, we want to be picking points up against these teams that are up and around us because uh, everyone seems to to be at the top, seems to be winning the games that you'd look at and think they should win, you know. And uh, But you have teams that are now improving in the January transfer window. You, you know, your Shrewsbury's are coming through now and Bolton signing a few players and, and players getting released. There's going to be a different look to the second half of the season and we all know how quick this goes, so... That could be a vital point at the end of the season. But for now, the emotions and the celebrations at the end there are something that will live for a long time. It's old Sky TV, get us on more, because that's what you get at Wickham Wonders. <laughs> and psychologically for Wickham, that equaliser against a big Sunderland team. The only other defeats this season at Adams Park have been against Ipswich and Portsmouth, two former Premier League teams as well. Psychologically, to not lose to a third big team at Adams Park, how important is that? Huge, huge, you know. It really is, Phil. And... Uh, I'd like to say that the fixtures we've played, we've played a lot of the top teams away from home, we've played a lot of the top teams at home now, we've got some more to come here, but I'm really pleased at where we sit right now, I think we've got enough to, to see the season out and maybe one or two more can come through the door, but I'm um, really pleased that TJ Debar getting minutes today, you know, that's a real step for him, another international coming on him and Daryl joining in the celebrations at the end, but... Um, you know, we'll see where we end up at the end of the season, but uh, no one will ever say that coming to Adams Park is boring. I told you, don't ever leave early. <laughs> you definitely shouldn't leave early, and Captain Joe Jacobson was man of the match. He also spoke to Phil afterwards. I said this already this season, death taxes and injury time goals at Wickham Wanderers, and, and you're, you're cropping up with a lot of them now. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be a, a running theme over the years, doesn't it? But, but I think that, that sums us up perfectly. I think the game kind of sums us up uh, this season. We've been um, probably a bit leaky defensively, but always a threat gone forward scored some goals today I thought we could have probably could have scored a few more as well and you know with us and with the gaffer behind us we'll never we'll never give in we'll never give up and even when they scored we looked at everyone everyone's gone we've got five minutes five minutes plenty of time to go and get goal and thankfully uh, we got a little bit of luck at the corner and, and it managed to bundle it in and, and get the draw that I probably think we deserved even though they, they had some chances as well I've not seen the replay yet uh, what happened in there? I was like prime Kevin Nolan trying to um, trying to be a poacher in the box. Do you know what? I only went in to um, to try and block Ross Stewart from from getting a clean head on the ball. And Chris has produced a great header. That he's a, a huge threat from set pieces and just fell to me. And I kind of just tackled it in with my right foot, which um, is a is a strange thing in itself. But um, I'll take it. I'll take it for sure. And at the other end of the pitch, there was a, a dramatic scissor kick clearance off the line as well from you. Yeah, um, you know, there's something that we work on. The, the gaffer always says, you know, following shot defensively attack and he think think like a striker think about trying to get a goal and as soon as the, the shot came in and it, and it came off to, to Ross Stewart I just kind of thought right I'll get back in and try and help out and it's one of those that a yard, I probably gambled on it a little bit if he heads it the other way it's a goal and, and just fell nicely and I managed to get a little boot on it and go over and I was probably more pleased with that than the actual goal in the end because that's stuff that you know as a defender we work on a lot and um, yeah it's something that epitomises what we're about as well It's been a tough week for both teams in terms of Covid uh, <coughs> Sunderland have players out Wickham had um, coaching staff out and, and possibly Jason McCarthy and, and David Wheeler as well how is it preparing for these games? At the minute you know the gaffer spoke before the game and said like you know, we, we've always dealt with adversity. You know, we say it, we actually do things as well in, in training. We've had days on, on dealing with momentum in games and adversity in games. And, you know, it's something that, that we just deal with. We've got a great squad here now. We've got players who can come in at the last minute. Um, Ollie Pendlebury came off the bench. He'd been training this morning and, and got a call an hour before to say Jason's pulled out. Jason was going to play and, and, and pulled out. He wasn't very well before the game. And, yeah, it's, it's something that we can all ad ad adapt to. There's players who came into the start in 11 that may not have been playing. And, and it's great that they've put on a great performance as well so um, it's something as football at the minute 
the way it is with, with COVID and, and games getting called off, you, you've got to just deal with what's put in front of you. And, and today, even though we started a little bit sloppy, I thought um, we put on a, a great performance in the end. And Gareth Fainsworth back in the dugout after missing two games. How, how important was that for you as players? I've just seen a picture of him giving um, Lee Harrison a piggyback or, or Harry giving him a piggyback. So I think that sums him up. You know, he's been desperate to kind of um, be involved after the Charlton game. We got him on the FaceTime in the change rooms and, um, you know, he was screaming and wooing and, and you could tell he was desperate to get back involved. And this week he's been as bouncy as ever. And, um, you know, for him to, to get that result at the end, I think he was, he was as happy as anyone else. So a late equaliser today, a win at Charlton. But this is a huge month, January, for Wickham Wanderers and the top six. Uh, Momentum-wise, that was important to get that equaliser. Yeah, look, we knew before the game that if Sunderland beat us, that's, that's eight points. And the way, the form that they've been in, it's going to be a huge ask to call that back. But when you get goals like that, you could see the two sets of the players, the two sets of supporters at the end of the game. It was it was a massive um, chasm in, in their feelings. And, you know, we've got that momentum now. We just scored a goal. We're on a high. We, we had a good result against Cheltenham. And, um, you know, little things like that. We wanted to take points off the top teams. We didn't get the win today, but it's another point that, that stops them going in the right direction so um, you know we, we spoke as well about picking up more points against against top teams and, and we started off with a point today we, like I said we've got a tough few games coming up but you know we've, we've got great spirit and great momentum now and, and hopefully we can pick up more on Tuesday It really does feel as well that you know, especially the home form is really really good It really does yes Easy to muddle up Cheltenham and Cheltenham they both play in red after all don't they <laughs> Yes but very different directions uh, Yes that's true uh, not like me going to Blackpool or Blackburn, was it, that time? Um, let's go to Tuesday night then um, and the Bolton Wanderers game. A um, little bit of a struggle on the M6, apparently, uh, but the team and, and Phil and, and most of the supporters managed to get there in the end. Um, and it was a good evening was had by all, really. Uh, fairly comfortable in the end, 2-0 win. Uh, Brandon Handel scoring after 35 minutes and then Jack Grimmer after 52. Jack Grimmer coming up live on the Wickham Sound, Wickham Wanderers show on Wickham Sound uh, in the next 15 minutes or so. Quite exciting. Uh, thanks, though. Here's Gareth uh, speaking to Phil once again. We've developed a way of, of performing and playing around the edge of the box now. It's it's a great sort of new way of playing, but um, it's a big result for us in our way at Bolton on Tuesday night. These are the games that, that really mean a lot you know Saturdays at home against Sunderland and Oxford you know you're going to get your boys up for that and you're going to get your crowds in but coming up here and massive credit to the Wiccan fans who made the trip you know I know there's chaos on the roads at the moment and uh, they'll go home happy but um, we needed them and we needed to make sure that we were we were really professional in what we did tonight we know what Bolton's strengths are and we had to negate them and I thought the boys carried out the plan really well and limited Bolton really to long balls to the right winger which we knew would be a target and, uh, and how we dealt with that would have been key to the game today. Uh, you made that switch in the second half responding to, to Ian Everett moving Fossey further up the pitch and uh, earlier in the season there was a, a two goal lead away at Fleetwood where the substitutions made a, a quick impact but you were able to negate that today by switching the system. <laughs> yeah, away at Fleetwood. I subbed to first and then Simon Grayson subbed second and he reacted to me so a probably a lesson learned from me be a bit more patient um, and even you know, 10 years in the job you, you love learning lessons and you love making things work but uh, I thought Fossey was uh, a real shining light for Bolton tonight I thought he's very very quick direct he's going to be a good player a good young player you know, and, uh, and he caused his problems on that right hand side so we had to adjust to you know, to deal with him and to deal with what Bolton were going to throw at us. And, uh, you know, we went to a four late on, uh, four, three, one, two, to deal with their shape. Um, and that was to see the game out. And I thought the subs, Curtis Thompson, Dow Horgan, made an, a real big impact tonight. Um, doesn't always happen like that and don't always get it right, you know, obviously. Fleetwood, as you say, but um, tonight it paid off and uh, say thank the boys, they were they were brilliant tonight. Bolton oh, did have pressures, uh, pressure in the game and spells, so you, you delighted with the clean sheet as well? Yeah, absolutely. Every team's going to get their spell, you know, they, they sort of gamble then and they, they're leaving one on one and two on two at the back because they need to come at us and uh, and so teams aren't going to get their spells, but um, David Stockdale's experience. Uh, yeah, I don't think there was major trouble apart from when they hit the, the post right at the end. I thought the first 10 or tw- 
20 minutes they had better chances but again we had a couple of real good chances Gareth and Cleary going through and, uh, and Brandon before he scored so um, yeah really pleasing tonight We're really pleased with the boys and as I say we have no fit players at home we've brought absolutely everybody today um, with the pandemic um, you know Adam Leathers is is made the bench which again he's, he's a young boy coming in um, no minutes absolutely no minutes Oli Pendle will be very limited TJ Debar's second game you know Chris Freeno picks a knock up so we've got real limited uh Resources, so again, that's why it's such a big result tonight. And a real collector's item this evening a goal from Jack Grimmer, who's first for the club. Uh, I, I will uh, get everyone to rewind to Wembley when Coventry got promoted, I think, from League Two and have a look at the, the goal. I don't think there's too much difference apart from the shirt he's wearing. Uh, he only scores left foot top corners, I think, Jack Grimmer. And uh, if I'm honest, it couldn't have come at a better time. Um, it really did ease the pressure, but Jack's been phenomenal. Really, really good player for us, and uh, and he knows his job, executes what I ask to the letter, and a great lad to have in the squad. So, brilliant goal, and uh, really pleased for Jack. Big point on Saturday, a win away at Bolton this evening. At the perfect platform for a home encounter against Oxford United. <laughs> yeah, um, the M40 derby, and sorry, Oxford fans, I know you'll be shouting at the radio now, but it is, um, and we can't wait for, um, for Adam's part for them to come down and uh, and obviously it was a real good game at their place Carl's, Carl's a friend and uh, he'll have that team very organised and they're one of the, the teams fancied for the playoffs and, or promotion as well so um, get the boys recovered get back um, and we'll be working on Oxford as much as we can over the next few days hopefully getting some back from injury and, uh, and pandemic uh, testing and uh, I'm sure it'll be a great great occasion on set. You know, we've turned the corner now in, into the new year uh, and it's the sort of time of year when fans, when they're watching the goals sliding, they're also checking their phones, seeing what's going on elsewhere and, and the table. Uh, you must be delighted to see where Wickham are. And, you know, there's games in hand for those around, but you've got the points on the board. Yeah, points on the board are always, uh, always crucial, you know. But, you know, we're going to have got plenty of games in hand with us, uh, as, as well as some other teams after tonight. But uh, as you say, points on the board are crucial. You know, you don't want congestion at the end of the season. With Cambridge United fixtures and the FA Cup when they're on, we're going to have to have those. Um, we don't want any more, so we want to try and get as many points and as quick as we can on the board. But, you know, this result doesn't make a season. We've got a big, big game on Saturday now, and uh, we'll be focusing on that. Highs aren't too high, lows aren't too low, and that's, uh, that's how it works. Online, on Radio Player, and on 106.6 FM, this is Wickham Sound. Still to come on the Wickham Wanderers show, we will be hearing from Jack Grimmer live. <laughs> yeah, that was well rehearsed, that bit, wasn't it? It was, um, it was very well rehearsed. <laughs> um, but first of all, talking about Wickham Wanderers women, I finally worked out that that's what I have to call them and not the not the L word um, so anyway they lost uh, at the weekend 5-2 uh, against uh, another one of the Abingdons um, having played uh, Abingdon at United the previous week when of course they lost 8-1 uh, although that was a cup match uh, in the league they lost 5-2 uh, away at Abingdon at town um, however, in the little mini league that they are currently in, because they are currently sixth uh, in the, the uh, Southern Region Premier Division, um, they, they are doing OK. They play Eastley in the Community. Honestly, that is the name of a football team. Eastley in the Community on Sunday away, 3pm kickoff. Eastley are currently just four points above Wickham Wanderers women. So a big game uh, for the women on Sunday. Wish them all the best for that. Uh, now, though, our uh, fantastic uh, regular slot with uh, the Wickham Wanderers Ex Players Association. Thanks, always, as always, to Alan Hutchinson and JDT uh, for setting up these chats, which uh, are fantastic. I thoroughly recommend uh, listening to this one as well with Keith Sill, who was a striker in the 70s and uh, did pretty well during his time at the club. And here's how it all started. Funnily enough, I was approached by Mr. John Reardon. Uh, I, was, uh, in Dua, I was playing for Wildstone at the time. And uh, there was a knock on the door, and John Reardon was standing there. I didn't know who John Reardon was, but there he was. And uh, he said he would be interested, if I would be interested, in coming to play for Wickham Wanderers. Now, obviously, I knew Wickham Wanderers were in the same league as Wildstone at the time, but I didn't know very much about them. But uh, that's how I I came to to join Wickham, and uh, I'm very glad I did. So what were your first impressions when you first arrived? When I first arrived, it was very good. I mean, uh, we had a load of uh, players there, which were basically quite local. You know, local. They had a good local base to the team, 
but Brian Lee obviously came in as the manager, and uh, he decided he he wanted to bring a few more players in and uh, play a certain type of football, which eventually turned out to be very successful. But the sound, the the base of the team was there through local players and one or two, you know, from Oxford, and but uh, and then he started to bring you know players in from further away who he thought might fit into his uh, way of playing and. Uh, Unfortunately for him, it worked, and for me. <laughs> you know, obviously with uh, Mr. Horseman, we formed a, a very good partnership. You know, he knew. You know, it's, it's sort of telepathic, really, because I mean, he was just a natural finisher, Tony. You put the, put him anywhere near the box, in or around the box, nine times out of ten, he will score. But he knew that I was half decent in the air. That's not me saying that. It's other people telling me that. You know, but if the ball was in the air and it was played up to me, he knew that I would try to put him in somewhere around the goal. That's this is, this, this is something that uh, I'm not very impressed with in the Premiership. You don't get many people, strikers, that can head the ball properly. You know, you, you, I know it's a, a contentious thing about heading the ball nowadays with, you know, injuries, brain injuries and that, but... Um, you could always redirect the play when the ball's in the air. But I knew where Tony was, and he knew that I was going to put it somewhere near him. So, yeah, we formed a great partnership. He scored lots of goals. I gave him loads of assists. But fortunately, I scored lots of goals as well. So that was that. And obviously Steve Perrin as well, someone who, who, who teamed up. Well, Steve with. came a bit, yeah, he came a bit later on, Steve. Very good player, different type of player. Worked hard, good goal scorer. But, yeah... The thing about the Wickham at that time, Brian Lee got us playing what I call proper football. <laughs> and we did play proper football, and we were very successful at it. But he had a good blend of local players and people, as I just explained, from outside the area that had to travel to Wickham to play. But as we became more successful, then you had more players wanting to come off Steve to come to play for Wickham Wanderers because they were successful and they did play good football. I bumped into Steve later on. He became a professional with Crystal Palace and I had moved on to one of my other clubs. You might have heard that I played for several other clubs. <laughs> the boys still take the mickey out of me. They called me a soccer mercenary because <laughs> I played for loads of clubs. <laughs> but I was playing for Enfield at the time and we played against Crystal Palace and Steve Perrin was playing for Crystal Palace and I was playing for Enfield. So, you know, we bumped into each other later on after finishing with Wickham. So that was interesting. And then it felt like a real golden era because obviously uh, Tony Bodger Horseman went on to, to create records for the club. And, and as you say, you, 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 between you scored many goals and won titles as well. Yeah, I mean, I was fortunate enough to win, I think, I don't know, three, four titles with Wickham. But then I went on to Enfield and I won two titles with them so I think if you look in the record books I'm up there with probably the most Ishmael League titles or someone that's near the most so yeah I was very fortunate in, in that respect and obviously the 75 season really stands out with, with the league title and also doing so well in the FA Cup as well yeah well I mean that obviously if you talk about memorable games you talk about the Middlesbrough game which was excellent. From I mean, this doesn't happen very often. We played them at home, obviously. They came down. They was top of the old first division. And uh, we was obviously non-league. And uh, at home, we gave them a good game. Obviously, in the replay, we went up to Middlesbrough. There's a full house, 30 or 1,000 people there. Great experience. But uh, we was under the cosh most of the game. Our defence, and, and, and particularly John Maskell, played very well that game. And they scored in the last couple of minutes, and we lost the game 1-0. But we came away with our heads held high. But that was a, a wonderful experience. But also, you know, one of the, my most memorable games for Wickham was um, scoring the winning goal against Dagenham and Redridge. They brought a title to us. That was a 1-0 win at, at Lokes Park. And I was fortunate enough to score the goal that secured the title for us. That was very good. So what are your memories of that day? It was, you know, it was a big crowd there, and we, we've got Dagenham and Redbridge, I think they was third in the league at the time. Enfield, was, were, who finished second, 
but we had to beat Dagenham to actually secure the title. And we managed to do that 1-0, but it was a fantastic game. I managed to get the winning goal. I was at the top of the hill. I put up, actually, it was a cross come shot. <laughs> and it went in, the goalkeeper was, was going backwards down the hill, and he, he couldn't get to it. And it went in, the, <clears throat> went in the far corner, and that was the 1-0 win, and it was fantastic. So that was another title, and that was just another memory that uh, I relish. And your displays also on you a couple of uh, England amateur caps, which you must be very proud of as well. Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, or when I got into it, in the more serious, you know, the amateur game, if you like, there was the Amateur Internationals, and the FA Amateur Cup, which was played a final, which was played at Wembley. Now, I had two ambitions. One was to play in an Amateur Cup final, which I never achieved, and the other one was to win an amateur cap. I got called up by Charles Hughes for the game against West Germany. And uh, I was called up, I was in the squad, I never started the game, but I came on a sub at half-time, it was nil-nil, and uh, I managed to score a goal, and we won that game 1-0. Now, a lot of people can say they haven't played at Wembley, but I can say I played at Wembley and I scored at Wembley, <laughs> so that was fantastic. My other regret is obviously I didn't win an Amateur Cup uh, winner's medal. The nearest we got was with Wickham. We played Hendon in a semi-final at Brentford. And that was probably one of my most disappointing days because uh, we lost that game 2-1. And we didn't quite really play as, as... We was one of the... You know, we was a really good side, but we never actually played as, as well as we could. And we got pips 2-1. Johnny Hutchinson scored our goal. But uh, we lost that 2-1, so that was a very bis- disappointing day. And something else that really comes across with having the opportunity to, to speak to ex-players from that era um, is, is obviously how uh, talented you were as a, as a group of players, but also you know, how well you all got on as well. I think that reflects right the way through the Wickham. The Wickham history, you know, if, I mean, I played golf with, with Vinnie, Vinnie Faulkner and, and Keith Samuels, two, two gentlemen. They, you know, I really respect those two men. But I also play with Les Merrick, Colin Bunting, and Martin Priestley. Now, uh, Les and, and Colin played in the era before me. But you talk to them about their era, and their teams all got on. Our team all got on. The team after that, and I think this is carrying through into the present-day team. This is a team, I think, watching it, that I do, not... I don't go down there very often, but I watched the game last last weekend. Fantastic. But Gareth Ainsworth has got them working as a team. If you love one another in a team and you get on with one another in a team, you're going to run your best. You're going to work your best. You're going to do your best for your mate. If you've got prima donnas in your team that are not doing their fair share of the work, you're not going to get anywhere. And I think this is where Gareth is scoring points because he's got them as a squad, working as a squad, and they're going to be successful, and which they are being at the moment. That reflects on what Brian Lee and people before him and people after him brought to this club. I mean, I used to take my wife and children down to the football. Now, my wife doesn't like football, funnily enough, (laughs) but she used to come down because it was a... It was like a social gathering. Other wives were there. Other children were there. It was fantastic. And, uh, you know, as I say, 50 years ago, I played football with people who now I play golf with. It's amazing. It's fantastic that you've got that camaraderie and still that relationship to this day. Yeah. And uh, I think that was that, that sets Wickham apart. I mean, I, as I mentioned before, I played for several other clubs. And they do get in touch now and again. But it's not the same. You know, my heart, the amount of time I spent at Wickham, that's where my heart is. And that's where I had my best time. And because I was contented there, that's where I played my best football. I went on to win other titles and that with other teams, but Wickham was always in my heart. You must be very proud of your your goal-scoring record as well, 124 in 249 games. Yeah, that's like... Uh, won every other game, is it? Is that what we like to say? I but, think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of 
everything I did at Wickham, and I'm proud to be in the history books. But I'm also proud of the fact that there's one constant in all of this, and that's the people that watch us, you know. And, I, you know, while we're on the station, I would like to thank those people that supported the team when I played and supported me. I mean, there's other people that didn't like me, but you get, you know, different different uh, opinions and everything. But I would like to thank the Wickham fans that supported me all those years ago and uh, gave me good memories because there's one constant of a football club, and that is the fans. They're the lifeblood. And you did get really big crowds in those days. We did, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes more than what they get now. And that was fantastic. When Wickham was full, or Lokes Park was full, it was amazing. The atmosphere was fantastic. And you could always rely on the people of Wickham to turn up. It was great. Are there any sort of uh, off-the-field uh, sort of behind-the-scenes uh, memories that you especially have during your time at the club? As I said, it, it was like a... a, a, like a it was like a... So, not a social club, but, I mean, it was everything. My, my dad used to come down and watch. My brother-in-law, you know, it was like a... A big family. It was fantastic. It was just the way the place was run, and they. And because I came, if you like, from I came in from a distance to play for Wickham. The players that were there, local people that played for the club and that played for the club for a few, years, they were so accepting. You know, they they accepted me. You know, although I might have come from down the road near London the concrete jungle but and i've come out to, to wickham they just accepted me it was just fantastic so tell us a bit about what you went on to do after your time at wickham well you know obviously i went to play for enfield uh, for a few years and then i i got a little bit cheesed off if you like a little bit fed up with it and i decided that it was time for me to retire so i had a break but then i was getting on a bit but i started playing Local football. <laughs> I started playing at centre half, and I thought, "Blimey, if I'd have known it was so easy playing at centre half, I should have played that instead of playing up front and getting <laughs> knocked about all over the place." <laughs> but I played locally, and I actually paid subs to play the game. But yeah, and then I was assistant manager at Buckingham Town for a little while, but. Uh, I watched my boy play. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. You know, that's part of life. Something that life throws at you that you just have to get on with. And he was quite good. He played for Buckingham Town and Bedford Town, but I used to go and watch him. But apart from that, I, I didn't do anything. And I just, you know, I play golf now, which is good. I could try and get out with the boys once a week. And it's so nice that you've got those memories of that time that you can reflect on and, and those games, as you say, getting the winner against Dagenham and playing uh, against Middlesbrough as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, all my memories, or the majority of my memories at Wickham Wanderers are fantastic. They'll always be in my heart, and I'm glad I'm part of their history. I was going to say, do you feel a real kind of part of the, the foundations of, of where the club are today? Yeah, I think so, yeah. As I say, I think through the years, you know, um, this togetherness has brought them through. You could, I mean, you talk to Glenn Creaser and people like that in their era. It was the same. They had the same togetherness. And as I say, I think Gareth is doing this with the present Wickham team. Their togetherness is going to bring them, you know, good fortune. I think they've got a good chance of going back up this year. No, definitely. They're playing really well. Does it feel like a long time ago or does it feel like only yesterday? Uh, in my head... <laughs> It feels like yesterday. <laughs> My body's telling me it's a long time ago. <laughs> it feels like a long time ago, but, you know, while we're sitting, especially in these times when you've, we've had the pandemic and we sit here, I can always sit there and I can reflect, and, and, the, and they're good memories, you know, and it's nice to look back. It's nice to look back on the history, and uh, I'm glad to contrib contribute to it. Well, it's been fantastic to, to speak to you and reflect on your, your contribution and, and many congratulations on your success during, during the spell at the club and, and the goals that you scored and the contribution you did make. Well, that's, uh, thank you very much for, for finally being invited me. But once again, I'd like to reiterate, the fans are the lifeblood of the club. They're the constant. And I would like to thank them once again for supporting the team I played with, my teammates and me for supporting me and giving me such encouragement. 
Thank you very much. Really nice to hear from Keith Stell and get his memories uh, from uh, those, those seasons in the 70s. What an absolutely lovely interview. What, what, what a lovely man. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, just absolutely heartwarming. So so nice to hear. So nice to hear what he had to say about the fans as well. Um, and a goal-scoring record of one every other game. That's not bad, is it? No, exactly. And played so many games as well. And, and so many of those occasions to, to as you say, remember yeah, and reflect on. Definitely, yes. You know, hearing him talk about being a, an England amateur international uh, and scoring against, what, you're scoring against West Germany. Yeah. You know, that just uh, fantastic. Really, really good story. Really fantastic. As you say, yeah. uh, final part of the Wickham Order Show on the way. Online, on Radio Player, and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound. <laughs> Final part of the Wickham Wanderer show, looking ahead to uh, what's set to be a really big game on Saturday. Uh, around 8,000 expected. A big derby game it is too, with our friends at, uh, from Headington United. <laughs> um, or, or the Thames Valley Royals. Do you remember them? No. Yes, uh, of course. That's, yes, that's what they were going to be called when the, when the merger with Reading was going to go through. Yes, know. yes. Um, crazy but yeah, days. Yeah, the very, very crazy days. Um, but yeah, it definitely is a derby. Sorry, Oxford fans, but you know, it, it is. Um, and I, I think also, you know, games cement Derby status as well. And the fact that we had the, the playoff final uh, definitely means that, uh, in my mind, it is a Derby. Um, Oxford obviously doing OK at the moment. So they are currently in sixth position uh, in League One, uh, having played 25. Uh, so one less than us. Uh, they've won 12, uh, drawn seven uh, and lost six of their 25 games so far, scoring 40 goals and conceding at 27, giving them 43 points at the moment, um, putting them at level with Plymouth um, and also the MK Dons. And of course, MK Dons are the next visitors to Adams Park. Yeah, we, we heard in the interviews that, that Phil were doing, it's a real, it's, it's, we, it sounds quite cliche today, doesn't it? but it's, it's a big month. It is. It's a, an important time. Um, and I think, if again, if we can just stay where we are, if we can stay in that leading pack, um, then we will be very well positioned uh, to hopefully make a, a decent bid come the end of the season. And as well, it just goes to show that with, with Lincoln winning on, on Tuesday against Sunderland, then... You know, the, the, the sort of the league table itself is is not really a guide and anyone can up, have upsets at any time. Yeah, so, so true. And you do wonder, is it going to happen to Sunderland again? Because they do seem to always find a way to conspire to not get out of the division. Um, and it, it didn't look like that for a while. You did think, oh, OK, yeah, they finally sorted it out this year. But all of a sudden, and I certainly didn't see a, a, a loss to Lincoln coming along, um, you are beginning to think, well, yeah, OK, uh, they might be in a little bit of trouble. Um, but it is that same thing as always at sort of like this, maybe not quite this time of the season, but in a month or two or so, mm. whoever puts in that decent sort of like seven, eight, nine game winning run, I think will probably, you know, will probably go up. I, I think Rotherham might do it as well, personally. That's your sort of looking ahead. I, there think. is, yeah. I mean, I don't. I know Wigan have now got five games in hand over you know over us and lots of other teams. I, I think they're going to be like Rotherham last season. I think that that's just going to be too many games to cram into a short space of time. They're still in the FA Cup as well, which doesn't necessarily help them. Um, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily see Wigan as being the team that are going to get promoted. Um, but Rotherham have seemed to be fairly consistent, whereas everybody else seems to have come and gone during the season. I was going to say Oxford, comparatively recently, seem to have a decent run of results some really positive um, scores but then can you know suffer defeats as well yeah yeah I mean this is the thing is, is that one of the reasons that we like League One and, and that we like the Championship though I think they're, they're a better product than the Premier League is that anyone can beat anyone on, on any given day really um, and I think we've seen that so often this season um, and you know there's some crazy results that you haven't seen coming uh, you know where Doncaster have beaten teams uh, you know Gillingham have got results although obviously they've just let, let Steve Evans go um, and so yeah it's by no means uh, guaranteed at all that we're obviously going to get a result on Saturday um, but the momentum in the team um, is definitely going the right way you know ever since the, the loss to Ipswich Town the, things have been, been going well this month and obviously the pandemic playing a real part as well we've seen in recent games how uh, the manager and, and Richard Dobson as well has been affected recently and again mentioning an interview with Phil there that, that David Wheeler and uh, Jason McCarthy have not been well so obviously wish them all the best yeah I mean it, it's interesting though isn't it that with other teams that we've played we've had confirmation mm. and I, I asked Gareth outright um, 
I think it was before Christmas now, I can't remember, I think, I think it was when we knew that one of the games wasn't going ahead, and I said, you know, have there been any COVID outbreaks? And that straight away, you know, he was very much, we're not going to discuss individual cases, you know, that that's that's a private thing. Um, I find it interesting that we we know about him, and we know about Dobbo, and we know about the other members of the coaching staff, the fact that they've actually had COVID. Whereas with the players... It's a little bit more of a vague, oh, well, the, the, Jason McCarthy was taken ill before the, the kickoff. Um, and I, I think another sort of almost euphemistic way that it was put was something like, oh, suspected positive test. And you think, well, hang on, you know, we've all taken lateral flow tests. I don't know whether it's lateral flow or PCR, but you can't necessarily have a suspected positive test because that little line is either there or it's not. You know, what were they were they holding it up to the light and thinking, is is that a positive or not? Um so I find it quite interesting that yeah, that that we're being quite aloof about our players' COVID states. No idea why that is, but it appears to be working. What you know, whatever reason that we're doing it. Um and obviously we haven't had a game called off yet. But interesting that Gareth was saying that with regards to Tuesday night, you know, they were pretty much down to, to anyone that could play. Um, you know, the fact that Adam Leathers, who, who appeared in some of the, the uh, Papa John's games earlier on this season, he was on the bench. Um, clearly, we, we were getting down to, you know, to maybe the bare bones. But it's still a decent bare bones to have. The fact Absolutely. that you can go up and beat Oxford United. Uh, Oxford United? Oxford Wanderers. Uh, uh, sorry, Bolton Wanderers. That's <laughs> them, isn't it? The fact that you can go and beat Bolton Any Wanderers of those teams. Any, any of those teams, yes. And really nice that we heard in the uh, interviews as well uh, the tributes to uh, fans who have, who have died recently and uh, Alana Herford, of course, um, who will have a, a special um, commemoration, if you like, in the Oxford game as well. On the 29th minute, there'll be uh, a minute's applause. And uh, we also heard a little earlier on that uh, the manager, Gareth Ainsworth and Pete Keogh, went to uh, David Robertson's uh, funeral earlier on today as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we seem to have talked about this too many times this year and I, I mean that just in you know that it is, is a sad season that we have lost um, a lot of very important chairboys fans and members of the chairboys family um, and the, the, even the the game just gone so there was the, the round of applause on 21 minutes to remember all of those who, who'd passed away mm. in, in the uh, previous year um, but really really you know the, the club are so good at just remembering and just marking these occasions they're doing it really well and again they'll be doing it um, at the game against Oxford this coming Saturday no, definitely, really, really special. And uh, something else which has which has happened this week is uh, Rob Kuig uh, did a, a webinar uh, to, uh, to sort of really sort of lay out, I guess, for uh, the, the sort of the plans for the club, which is especially interesting being the, the transfer window as well. And I think the the interesting thing um, is that that's the the old uh, access to the stadium, uh, which you know is one of those things that has been really sort of like trundling along ever since uh, we can moved to, to Adams Park. That has, has reared its head again. Um, but sounds quite positive, actually, uh, this time. Um, so very much, you know, that the, yes, the, the, they are still looking into that side of things. Um, and I, I think it's more of a watch this space. Uh, and from what I understand as well, also uh, stadium uh, redevelopment was mentioned, but it was very much said that actually there's no point in doing any of that before the access issue is, is sorted out. But other interesting things, uh, Wickham TV is likely to be up and running by February. That you know that that sounds interesting. Well, yeah, that's it. and you think, well, what you know, what what exactly is that? That sounds more doesn't sound like a TV show. That sounds actually like a channel. Hmm. Uh, you know, how long? You know, is that that going to be on all the time? Show, show and showing what exactly? Really, really interesting. Um, they're looking uh, as well uh, with regards to not necessarily redeveloping the stadium, but certain things such as the improving the toilets, uh, which I think you know, yes, okay, that's still something that yeah, you know, we 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 possibly haven't got Premier League toilets yet. So if we could have that. But very much like the Premier League Wi-Fi, that's absolutely fine. Yes. Um, also like the fact as well uh, that the merchandise was talked about. And I love the way that Missy Kuhig will send tweets about the merchandise. I think that's one of the, the really, really sort of heartwarming things mm. is to see that actually, you know, our owners are so hands-on um, that you've got the owner's wife actually being able to tweet and say oh look well we still got you know just she she sent a tweet earlier on this week saying you know just to let people know just warning you we haven't got many of the calendars left um and the bottles of gin are going quite well and you think well, it's great that actually the owner's wife is so involved in the club shop i know shops are her thing um but really really nice to see yeah definitely and i guess we should sort of lower our expectations perhaps in terms of uh, arrivals during the january window yes I, I i think that's you know that, that's what we understand although we have heard something along the lines of well you never know about about loanies mm -hmm. 
Um, has, has Uchi gone anywhere? I've forgotten to look at that this week. No, I, I don't think that, so, yeah. No, exactly. So, you know, so, so he's still around, and you do wonder, well, are we going to have another case um, of a, a former Wicker Wanderer coming back? Would it be Uchi? Might, might it be somebody else? Uh, Alex Samuel? You, you just you know you, you just don't know, but given that we went to Bolton and you know and we we were down to the bare bones, you would think that actually you know Gareth would be pleased to have anybody coming through the door that actually that he already knows that he already trusts. So I do wonder whether we might be seeing somebody that actually that is familiar um, to chair boys fans and players as well. Of course, we heard from him last week talking about how difficult it will be for for clubs to you know they wouldn't probably let players go out on loan because they'll need the numbers in terms of you know needing them as backup for for COVID cases as well. Yeah I mean I think we're seeing quite a lot of that I think we're also seeing just in the the transfer window it seems to have been a very quiet transfer window so far Um, and with clubs recalling players just as you say almost to make up the numbers Um, so it's just another one of these crazy times that we're in with regards to football and Covid isn't it Uh, you know hopefully things will eventually sort themselves out and and shake down uh, in in a way that will be favourable to Wickham Wanderers so it'll be lovely to see some of those uh, former players come back and and play a part maybe in getting us to to get back to the Championship Similarly unlikely to have any outgoings either probably for very similar reasons Yeah yeah exactly uh, I mean, again, I, I think you, you slightly hope that as well, <laughs> in that you, you don't want players to suddenly look too good at this time of year. Uh, we've definitely had that in the past. But I don't think it's anything that we particularly have to worry about at the moment, which I think is a really good thing. And again, a, a sign of actually how strong and how stable and secure the club currently is. In exactly the same way that seeing the last two Reading results uh, where Reading lost to Fulham 7-0 uh, on, was it Wednesday night or Tuesday night? Um, and obviously were knocked out of the FA Cup by Kidderminster Harriers. And surely there must be question marks over their manager uh, at the moment. And in times gone by, whenever there have been question marks over, say, the Reading manager in the same way as those positions at QPR, uh, at Blackburn Rovers, at Preston North End, we've always slightly worried. We all know that, that Gareth hails from the, the Reading area of Berkshire and you do think well you know yeah if that job came up it would obviously it might suit him more to be be at Reading rather than it would at Adams Park but at the moment I I don't know about you but I feel no concern about that whatsoever I think if if Reading were to be looking for a new manager I can't see that Gareth would say oh yeah do you know what that's a good idea let's let's go and join Reading uh given that the way things are going we may well be swapping swapping divisions with them next season exactly and listening to him speak you obviously definitely get the impression that you know he's happy here he may have had offers but he, he's very pleased with the the sort of project that he's got I, th- I think he's a very um well-developed and well-rounded human being in that I think he 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 very much takes things such as family and security and happiness very much that they are very important to him he's not somebody who necessarily is looking for the the financial benefits from life and he knows that actually yeah he's he's happy at Wickham Wanderers he's at the right club he knows that the owners are very happy with him he knows that the fans absolutely love and adore him and that one day I'm absolutely sure that there will be a statue of Gareth Ainsworth somewhere uh, in (laughs) in Wickham Town Centre and so he's perfectly happy to to remain where he is and that's really really good i i'm sure one day and i said this to him at the end of last season when we sat down and had a long chat you know i i i I can't believe that one day he's not either going to go to QPR or I think probably more likely that he will go to Blackburn Rovers because Blackburn Rovers Mm. clearly are his first love. They were his club. He's from Blackburn. He went to Ewood Park, first of all, to watch football. I would imagine that one day, yeah, he will will go uh, to Blackburn Rovers. But I think we're still a long, long way from that. And just finally, the, we mentioned how, how important and key uh, January could be. Uh, we've got Oxford coming, another home game at the end of the month as well, as we mentioned with Milton Keynes, uh, Dons, given their full name. Uh, and also uh, a trip to Morecambe in between that, of course, a uh, 4-3 at Adams Park back in October. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, you know, that was a great game as well, wasn't it? Um, and a ni- nice day out by the seaside. It'll obviously be a bit cold. Um, but yeah, and that MK Dons game uh, does now seem to be looming quite large as well. Uh, it would be lovely if that could be the end of a perfect... January for, for Wickham Wanderers or an almost perfect January for Wickham Wanderers obviously we didn't beat Sunderland um, but you know yes that, that game does look particularly big um, and and is one probably if you were to ask me I'd say probably is a bigger derby game than the Oxford United game sorry Oxford fans and then five in February as well just looking slightly further ahead 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, they do come thick and fast. But th- this is also what I mean about Wigan, is that, you know, you're looking at our fixtures and you think, well, goodness me, there's a club below us that's got got to fit an extra five games in and are still in the FA Cup as well. Um, I definitely think that they're going to go down the, the Rotherham route. Um, but yes, five in February, Shrewsbury at home, Lincoln away, Cheltenham at home, Wigan at home, Accrington Stanley away. Um, again, you know, it's, it's not going to be an easy month, but I think we'll get there. I was going to say, it does seem really positive at the moment, doesn't it? Just a point off the top, as we mentioned. Yeah, uh, and brilliant. The, uh, actually, what we've seen so many times over the years is that we've, you know, we've really faltered it over Christmas and the New Year, and it's taken us a while to actually recover. Well, we haven't had that this year. You know, yes, OK, we, you know, we had the slight wobble against Ipswich, but other than that, um, we've, we've, we've done OK, and we're still there, and we're still looking good. Thank you very much. Apologies we weren't able to bring you uh, our chat with uh, Jack Grimmer this week. Hopefully we'll have him on, on a, a future edition of the show. I was uh, doing my best Jack Grimmer impression, but it, it wasn't very good, really, was it? <laughs> but, but your goal against Bolton was very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I did enjoy that. It was the best one I've ever scored. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Have a good week and uh, enjoy the game on Saturday if you're going. Look at that. We've got through the whole show without mentioning dog leads. Oh, oh no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>